remove the thing, the whole thing. Yeah. Can you see me well? So yes, yes, Rohini, we can see you very well. Okay. Perfect. Uh, just a couple of minutes more, Rohini. Thank you for joining. Yeah, no issue, no issue. I'll just... I'll... Uh... Oh, is this coming? Yeah. But where is the switching off the video thing? Okay. Somewhere back to my thing. Good evening. Good evening. It's okay. Oh, thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Namaste. Namaste. Uh, shall we start on time, you think? Uh, yes, Rohini. Just one minute more. We're just waiting for... Uh, and then people will keep joining, but we'll start sharp at time. So just one more minute. No problem. No problem. Um, students from IFM are also joining through one link. They are sitting together. So just waiting for those to join and then we'll start. Uh, Ravi Chandran, sir, uh, um, are the students joining from the classroom? So you're muted. They, they have left the classroom. They will be joining from the hostel. So. Right, sir. Okay. Um, Bisudeep sir, you are muted if you are trying to say something. You are still muted. Okay. No, I'm just saying okay. hi, Rani. Okay, great. Yeah, hi, hi. How are you? All good. Okay, yeah. fantastic. So, I think we can start, Rohini. A lot of folks are also watching this on YouTube live in the hostel and a lot of students have joined and alumni and then I think that they join the next five minutes, but we can start in the interim. Okay. Perfect. So um, uh, I'm going to just, uh, so everybody, firstly, uh, thank you so much for joining the third edition of the Friends of IFM Speaker Series. And on behalf of the Alumni Association, Rohini, I'd like to welcome you and, and heartfully thank you very much for sparing the time. Uh, so uh, for everybody's benefit, I'm sure all of us know Rohini very well, but I'm still going to read out a part of her introduction and some of her illustrious work. Um, and then I'll hand over to the director, IFM, who also wants to formally welcome you, Rohini, on behalf of the institution, and then we'll move to your call, so uh, to your speech. So just a couple of minutes. Um, so everybody, uh, gives me great pleasure to wel welcome Rohini, Rohini Nilakani. She's an author and a philanthropist and has been a strong influence in the Indian social sector over the past three decades. Her work spans different sectors. Uh, she founded Argyam, a foundation for sustainable water and sanitation, co-founded Pratham Books, a non-profit enabling access to reading for millions of children. Um, she's currently the chairperson of Rohini Nilakani Philanthropies and a co-founder and director of Ek Step, a non-profit education platform. Uh, Rohini and, uh, and Nandan, her husband, are signatories to the Giving Pledge um, and uh, pledged away to give away half of their wealth to philanthropy, which is substantial. Uh, Rohini's first book, Stillborn, uh, was a medical thriller, and a second book, Uncommon Ground, was published by Penguin. Her latest book, Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, a Citizen First Approach, is a self published Creative Commons license book. Um, she's also authored 16 books for young children. I was also told uh, by her colleagues that there is another book in the works, and she's going to talk a little bit about or draw some inspiration and material from that as well. 
very, very critically for IFM and for all of us IFMites on the call. Rohini is a major supporter of conservation in the country, major supporter of wildlife, biodiversity, and forest conservation. Um, and over the years, because of all the work that she's done with many NGOs in the space, has some significantly interesting views on the subject, which I had the pleasure of discussing, albeit briefly, over a first call. So very, very welcome again, Rohini. Um, I'll now request uh, uh, Shri Ravi Chandran, the director of IFM, to also welcome you on behalf of the institute, and then we'll proceed to your speech. Uh, sir, over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, warm welcome to all present here. Uh, we are extremely grateful to Ma'am Rogini for accepting our invitation and uh, agreed to deliver the <coughs> talk. Indeed, we are really grateful to you, Ma'am. Uh, we've been privileged to extend a warm welcome on behalf of uh, the students, employees, and staff of the uh, Indian Institute of Forest Management. Uh, uh, sir, you're muted. Uh, 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 am I audible? You are. So, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Oh. There's Change. noise from Victor Chavas. Mike, mute yourself. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, warm welcome to all present here. In indeed, we are very grateful to. Uh, Ma'am uh, Rogni for accepting our invitation and agreed to deliver this talk as friends of IAFM uh, series. Uh, uh, indeed, it's a great uh, privilege for all of us in the Institute. Uh, we extend a warm welcome to you, Ma'am. Thank you uh, so much. IAFM uh, is established in the year 1982 with the vision to be among the leading international institutions in the area of uh, environment, forest and development management and be respected both nationally as well as internationally for its outstanding contributions in the fields of education, training, research, consultancy, and thought leadership. And uh, this institute is engaged in academics, research, training, and consultancy activities. And we are running currently running two postgraduate programs, one on postgraduate diploma on uh, forestry management, the other on postgraduate program on sustainability management. And this institute is engaged in uh, research in the field of uh, environment, uh, livelihood, watershed, forest, sustainable development, sustainability, climate change. You name anything in the environment sector, we are there. Our presence is there. And this institute has pro uh, produced more than 2,000 uh, alumni and they are working in various fields related to uh, the forestry, environment and development sector and we are really proud of them and uh, these uh, alumni are contributing their might in the overall development of this institute. The institute recognize their contribution. Ma'am, we have 11 center of excellences in the field of ecological services and management, sustainable forest management and forest certification, corporate social responsibility, policy studies, then climate change studies, forest-based livelihood and tribal studies, IAFM industry interface for sustainable development, forest hydrology and international center for community forestry, human wildlife conflict management and geoinformatics for forestry, climate and livelihood support. And we are also in the process of coming out with new centers for sustainable coastal resource management because coastal and marine areas are one of the key sectors for uh, conservation management and development. So this institute has embarked on a uh, lot of activities related to coastal and marine conservation. Then we are also in the process of coming out with the forest fire management center. And you know, a lot of, uh, of uh, degradation takes place because of forest impacted uh, areas and we need to restore them and bring them the biodiversity in that areas. So this institute is primarily working on all these issues and now we are in the process of engaging with various uh, stakeholders and with your uh, uh, presence here, uh, hope the kind of talk which you are going to deliver today will inspire all our students and add value to our students, faculty and the staff members. Uh, with this, I welcome you once again. Uh, 
we are looking forward to hear from you thank you so much thank you so much sir um rohini over to you now thank you so much thank you very much all of you um and um so as requested um, I'm going to speak for half an hour and then I really hope we can have some kind of interaction with uh, all those who are gathered here. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you all. I, and as we just heard, this institute plays a very important role in building professional capacity and leadership for sustainable environmental management. And in this most important decade of human history, when our collective actions will shape the future, I do believe that IIFM's time has truly come. And I hope that every institution in the country that is training the professionals of tomorrow in any sector actually, should they should partner with you in some way for at least some elective courses to understand the basic yet complex issues in the management of our forests and our biodiversity. There's no sector can stay aloof from these questions, not anymore. So, so first of all, I do want to confess that I come to you not as an expert of any kind, but as a concerned citizen who loves the wild, who escapes into it as often as I can, who is learning, just learning about forests and their flora and fauna, and who has been fortunate enough to support the work of some of the finest environmental CSOs in this country. I can be an unabashed romantic of the wild. I love the poetry and prose of the world's great environmentalists, including the delightful descriptions of nature in Kalidasa's works, the writing of the poet saints of the Bhakti movement, and in fact, I was lucky enough to recently be in Amrabad, Telangana, where we crossed the river Krishna to visit the cave where Akka Mahadevi, the 12th century Shiva devotee, sat for years in meditation to her Lord Chenna Malikarjuna, the Lord of the white jasmine flowers. And here is what she says of the dense forests that surrounded her in the Sri Salem area where she used to travel. The entire forest is a wish-fulfilling tree all the plants are life restoring. Every stone is an alchemic stone. Every place is a holy place. All water is unaging nectar and every animal is a man-like animal. Every stone you stumble upon is a wish fulfilling jewel. As I went around observing the mountain dear to Chenna Mallikarjuna, I saw the sacred plantain grove. This kind of poetry, which can really stir your heart, I hope it is included in some of your courses on forest management. Because even though you are a business school, a B school, you must never forget the title of Ursula Le Guin's novella, that the word for world is forest. And each of you, I hope, already take that idea to your heart and also to your mind. Now, for some years, I have been on a learning journey with many of the passionate and erudite people associated with institutions that I'm really proud to be part of, such as ATRI, NCF, Dakshin, Keystone Foundation, and so many others. And for a while now, I've been pondering this question, who will be the true stewards of our forests in the future? I think it's a question really worth asking. Because forests, as you might agree, are too important to be left only to the forest department, too fragile to be entrusted only to corporates, too complex to be left to communities alone, and too precious to be preserved only by the philanthropy of the rich. So perhaps we need to reimagine the role of all these components, those of Samaj, Sarkar, and Bazaar, if we are to truly conserve what we have and to rejuvenate what we had. So let's talk of Samaj first, because I think Samaj is the foundational sector and what happens in Samaj affects everything. So and in Samaj, by Samaj here, I include all components of civil society, we the citizens, communities, civic organizations of all kinds, and also the leadership of the Samaj. And as you know, there have been hundreds of millions of people living inside and around India's forests through the millennia. And even today, more than 500 tribal groups comprising 8.9% of our population, according to the last census, are still living in this country. That makes more than 100 million people whose ancestors near the forests like the palm of their hands, the Beals and the Bilalas, 
the Gonds and the Varlis, the Mizos and the Minas, the Khasis, the Bodos, the Garos, and so many other Adivasis of this great and ancient land. And yet today, most of these people do not live inside the forest anymore. The Tribal Health in India report released in 2018 by the Union Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has brought out some worrying aspects to this known development. There are fewer and fewer eyes in the forest, so to speak, because more than half the country's 104 million tribal population now resides outside India's 809 tribal majority blocks. To support this fundamental change in tribal habitation, the report cites the census 2011, which found a 32% decline in the number of villages with 100% tribal population between 2001 and 2011. And yet, not just tribal people, but a fifth of India's population, by some guesstimates, directly depend on forest-created resources for their livelihood. And as more and more migration inevitably happens away from forests, as people's aspirations change, as young people especially want more and different opportunities for their future, possibly in more modern and urban settings, we are then faced with this question, how much loss of knowledge will be experienced as the primary stakeholders of the forest become deracinated and uprooted from it? I don't think we can know the answer, but in my travels, I've personally seen that younger generations have less and less deep knowledge of the forest. And the new generation is changing. They may not even want to be off the forest, even when they are in the forest. And believe me, this is not a criticism of the youngsters at all. It is a testimony to the changing nature of the forest itself, of the strong state role in its management, as well as the demands of a modern education and the changing aspirations that arise from the encounter with modern technologies. Tribal youngsters see little hope in and reason to remain in deep association with the lands of their ancestors. And as a Samaj, I'm afraid we have been unable to reimagine their role as new stewards of these ancient Varnas of India. Yes, we have FCRA, I mean, sorry. Yes, we have FRA, we have CFRA, and there's definitely been some success in its implementation, however painfully slow. And that is really a worldwide innovation that we can be proud of. But surely there is scope to do more. Some states are trying. There have been many partnerships between the forest department, local communities and NGOs, especially in Madhya Pradesh, where you all are located, to increase livelihood opportunities for forest dwelling communities. Many small scale attempts have been made around the country to include them in the tourism trade as naturalists and guides, as homestay owners and ecotourism entrepreneurs. Some think tanks like ATRI and NCF have encouraged them to become researchers and advocates of better environmental policy. Many have been absorbed in the forest department itself, but yet none of this response is at the level of the problem and none of these innovations are sufficient to deploy the experience and expertise of our tribal communities for the urgent and common need of the country to enrich our forests. But so, if tribal communities can perhaps no longer be the primary stewards of the forest, and if we can no longer rely on their knowledge of forest ecosystems, then what will replace this as we are still on the topic of Samaj involvement, let us try to imagine some positive scenarios. First of all, can we encourage many more CSOs and academic and research institutes to generate much more knowledge and practice around conservation? We have a really rich history already in, in our country of people's movements for conservation, including the much talked about Chipko movement. But nowadays, in the rush for a particular development model, which actually we can little afford, maybe the trust between CSOs and society has broken a little. And it is time to restore that trust. In this polarized world, sometimes NGOs are derogatorily, refer derogatorily referred to as tree huggers or as anti-development. I hope we can go beyond this otherization. And the alumni of IIFM can play a huge part in this. I believe we need more civil society driven examples of ecological restoration, not less. I believe we need more tree huggers, not less. We need more people, ordinary people, ordinary citizens of the Samaj to rediscover wonder in nature, to celebrate it, to experiment with peaceful coexistence, to reduce conflict. 
ये देश मांगे मोर नॉट लेस सो आई गिव यू ओनली थ्री एग्जाम्पल ऑफ द डजन आई नो ऑफ द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ समाज ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड एज मेनी ऑफ यू आर लाइकली ऑल्सो टू ज्वाइन द डिवेलपमेंट सेक्टर दिस मे बी फेमिलियर टू यू बिकॉज आई पर्सनली सीन वॉट कैन हैपन वेन समाज इज गैलवनाइज टू प्रोटेक्ट फॉरेस्ट फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन माई स्टेट ऑफ कर्नाटका there is the beautiful agnashini river one of the few remaining rivers that flows free and undammed it is surrounded by the richest of forests and biodiversity of the western ghats many times in across the years there have been projects imagined to dam it to dredge around its estuaries and so on but the people there the local people have steadfastly opposed such developments and the river still flows as before meandering beautifully to the west in its aviral nilmar dhara many of you may have also heard of ncf nature conservation foundation's restoration work in valparai a small town located in the annamalai hills of tamil nadu it is a remarkable example of how states markets and civil society can collaborate to restore degraded ecosystems valparai was once a pristine forest ecosystem transformed into monoculture tea plantations causing massive habitat destruction and loss of biodiversity ncf worked to convince tea plantations and other private land owners to set aside a portion of their land for ecological restoration engage with local communities educate them about the importance of ecosystem restoration and engage local government as well to support this work today the valparai area is a success story with improved soil fertility increased water flow reduced erosion and increase in the area's biodiversity i have myself gone there and can attest to this work there is also in my last example the innovative work of a young organization called farmers for forests f4f works to protect and increase forest cover in india experimenting with the pes payment for ecosystems model and farmers and rural landowners are given semi annual cash payments in exchange for implementing actions that nurture young forests or protect the existing ones its model does two things at once it creates and maintains forests and provides farmers with additional income and some livelihood security and also resilience their mission to restore 30000 acres of land into forests by 2030 so having seen all these things my first point has been on how can we encourage csos more so that they can help steward forests together with communities Secondly I believe we can do much more to include urban residents of India in the stewardship of our biodiversity. After all we all depend directly indirectly not directly but indirectly on forest resources no matter how far from the jungles we may live for energy and food for water and medicines and for so much more. In fact never has there been a stronger need to tell this story better to urban citizens. But the good news is that cities are being reimagined all over the world they no longer need to be so separate from the idea of rural or green there is massive public demand for more open green for more open cities for more tree cover for cleaner air and for better mobility people can see the impact of pollution on their children's lungs they can directly feel the effects of urban heat islands and people in slums and dense tenements suffer even more they need sustainable urbanization even more and politicians always respond to public pressure this may result in better public transport more electrical vehicles more parks more trees and so on and quite naturally i hope alongside this renewal we will see urbanites getting reacquainted with the pleasure of being with trees birds animals of shinrin yoku as the japanese call it forest bathing and of being nurtured in nature our individual and collective well-being depends on allowing this demand to be fully met this is one of the reasons why nandan and i support the indian institute of human settlements iihs which is helping shape policy on urban futures and also builds out as is iifm armies of people that will be needed to sustainably manage our cities last but not least when it comes to samaj the future belongs to young people 
India is among the youngest countries in the world, as you very well know, with the largest cohort of people under 35 years. Slowly but surely, I believe they've begun to understand the deep connections between their survival and that of our forests. I think the pandemic reinforced this as well. There's immense scope to make these youngsters the stewards of our forests in the future. World over, it is youngsters leading the movements against a particular version of modernity and materialism, are rethinking consumption and the good life, are reconnecting with nature as never before. I have hope and faith that India's young leaders will ask bold new questions, will take a new bend in the road towards more sustainability. And that is why through my philanthropy, I support many organizations with dynamic young leaders, nudging youth in their areas to take on more responsibility for environmental issues. I'll give you a very quickly a couple of examples. There's the Paluyir Trust, Paluyir Trust, who believe, and I found through their practice also, that nature-based and outdoor learning outperforms traditional modes of instruction in schools. And they are working with many schools and colleges to share these methods and succeeding very interestingly. Similarly, you can have produced several documentaries on wildlife and conservation and conducted hundreds of outreach programs for India students and youth to, to, to make them feel proud of our natural heritage and the need to conserve it. And this has helped build a lot of environmental stewardship among students across India. So that's what I believe is the positive things, and I've told you just a slice of it, of what we can hope for, for Samaj actors to become stewards of our forests. So let's move to the Sarkar now. As you all very well know, this is the UN Decade on Ecosystem Regeneration. This is the year for COP28. This is the time to clean our air, to meet our NDC targets faster, to regenerate our forests as carbon sinks, through the ecosystem services, nurture human and animal well-being as well. This is the time to move forward on our commitments to sequester 2.5 to 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide by 2030 through enhanced tree, tree cover and to restore 5 million hectares of degraded and deforested land in the same period. This is the decade. This means that we now need to grow our forests by 12% in this very short time left to us. And when we think of these challenges, we have to understand that India is somewhat unique in both the challenges and in the opportunities. You already know this, so I won't belabor the point for too long. We know it's challenges because we have to continue to develop economically as well as ecologically. And no country, no country has had to do this with such an agonizingly sharp understanding of the required trade-offs. Not even China has had to do it at this scale. But the last state of the forest report released by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change in 2021 shows that the growth of India's forest cover has actually slowed to an eight-year low with only a 0.22% increase in the two prior years. Now, this next report which comes out will tell us whether that trend has continued or has been reversed. And we also know that this report is produced through satellite imaging. And unlike our tiger census, this one is not really ground truthed. In addition, it has clearly included plantations and even urban tree cover. So while both are desirable things, they are not forests. And so it remains for us to ask, how will we grow, the, grow out the forests that we need? In addition, the report also reminds us that by the end of this decade, 45 to 64 percent of our forests may be impacted by climate change. That is a hugely troubling scenario. And nobody understands all this better than the forest departments at the center and in the various states. And you all know that they have been deeply committed to forest and animal conservation. This is the 50th year of Project Tiger. And we have seen what success we have had by putting attention on this flagship species, what we have seen happening below just the idea of the tiger being conserved. There had to be a voice for the voiceless flora and fauna year after year after year. And yes, we do talk of a colonial hangover. We talk of mistakes made in the past, of too much concentration of power perhaps over the forest, of a perceived lack of trust between the department and forest dwellers or farmers and so on. 
I have met many amazing forest department officials in many parts of the country who, who honestly acknowledge all these shortcomings. And yet, when we understand the challenges forest department officials have to face, we can sympathize deeply. They have to guard the forest against invasives like Lantana camera, Prosophis juniflora, and Parthenium hysteroforus, to name just three that have colonized our forest, threatening animals and indigenous plants together. The forest department has to continuously deal with the pressures of encroachment, poaching, increasing human animal conflict, low budgets, lack of scientific capacity, lack of sufficient biologists and veterinarians, and so on and on and on while still fulfilling the demand for more trees, more tigers, more rhinos, and now cheetahs also. And some of you who will hopefully be joining the forest department um, will already be deeply aware of these challenges before that the forest department officials have to face. And as designated stewards of India's forest, we really thank the forest department for their work, and we hope that you will create many more innovative strategic partnerships that is the call to action. Can the forest department create more innovative strategic partnerships so that more and more people can come to the forest, not as tourists, not as exploiters, but as trustees of our natural heritage? And I personally witnessed many such innovations. In fact, I just came back from Madhya Pradesh's Page Forest, where Deputy Director Rajneesh Singh took me along with experts from Wildlife Conservation Trust to see the elevated corridor created by NHAI across 29 kilometers of the core forest area. I thought it was a marvelous innovation that has reduced conflicts and accidents and has kept a viable and patent corridor for animal crossings, which are abundantly proven through camera traps. Another example is the setting up of the Biodiversity Collaborative, led by the Principal Scientific Advisors Office, which has attracted a cohort of organizations to monitor and deepen local, hyper-local even biodiversity. Their youth-led rural outreach has aimed to create and enable pastoral youth to create locally relevant initiatives to enhance biodiversity and well-being. So there are many such innovative examples and we already know of programs that the government has initiated such as CAMPA, CAFA, Social Forestry Program, NAP and so on and so on. The Sarkar's role as we know in forest stewardship simply cannot be exaggerated. But there is much scope to reimagine this responsibility. I'm really no expert, but even I can see that perhaps it is time to overall the structure of the forest department to co-create something much more suited to the needs of this critical human century. Governments need to integrate issues of environment with other departments, not just the designated ministry. And we need more refined policy making to really monitor and protect our forests, the ones that we already have, and perhaps more bold policies on private conservation, which I shall come to shortly. So while for the Sarkar, it is not at all easy, while trying to lift the remaining 300 million people out of poverty to increase per capita GDP, we have pushed for a scorching pace of economic development. India is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. It is very much the flavor of the moment and hopefully the decade, and we can be suitably proud of that for sure. And for that, we've had to make some compromises, dismantle some environmental protection laws. We've had to make some trade-offs. But we know that we can ill afford these binaries between development and environmental protection. India simply cannot. It doesn't have the space, the time in history to cut off the very branch that it is perched on. And Sarkar has little choice to find the difficult but better balance between the growth of the economy and the growth of the ecology. And for this, I do believe it will need a deep partnership with market forces, which of course these, the union government is very open to and has made many deep international commitments on. So that leads us directly into Bazaar. How can markets and companies large and small respond better to the crisis that we face? I'm going to briefly refer only to three things business sustainability, CSR for environmental innovation, and private conservation. So let's take private conservation first. I believe we have a huge opportunity to amend our laws and policies to allow private citizens and companies to use their land for afforestation and renewal. 
Currently, an assessment of the legal provisions governing forestation on private land, prima facie shows that no prior legal permission is required by landowners to grow forests on their land. But there are legal consequences once a forest is grown on non-forest land. And this entails an understanding of how forests are defined. Our country is still struggling to adequately define forests, as you know better than I do. And these are protected under various regulations and many court orders, especially on non-forest land where forests are grown by private parties. Much more work needs to be done on this to make enabling policies, as in many other countries who have done this successfully, to allow private entities to use their lands for conservation without attracting penal provisions of some kind or another, or the threat of a takeover by the forest department. We need to carefully allow livelihood benefits for landowners, and especially for local communities, for ecotourism in these protected areas. These areas might also become safe spaces for research and monitoring of our amazing biodiversity. I know these are controversial positions to take. It's been years I've been thinking about these things, and I would love to engage in much more dialogue so that we do it. India learns how to do things on this new question in the right way, but we should be open to experimentation. Experimentation may result in failure or it may result in success. I hope we do experiment and that we succeed wildly. Uh, in addition, of course, corporations play can play a huge role, mainly by looking inside their fence and throughout their supply chain at how they can reduce negative externalities. Corporations like Infosys, which I know well because I happen to be a happy shareholder, are working hard to create sustainability inside their friends and across their supply chain. They have met many of the goals they had set, ambitious goals for net positivity in water and carbon. In addition, they're trying to green their campuses. The 35, 355-acre Mangalore campus has tried to replicate the complex biodiversity of the Western Ghats. And with over 5.5 lakh trees and shrubs, it has kind of grown into an ultra dense mini forest. And many other companies vigorously are working on better environmental stewardship. And with the right policy frameworks in place, I believe this trend will only grow. Not only because of government policies, but because in many surveys, it is becoming more and more clear that employees of companies also want their employers to do much more ESG good as they are trying to do well. So that brings us to CSR. About rupees 50,000 crores is spent annually on CSR across so many companies, but almost nothing from it goes into forest conservation or nature-based livelihoods or environmental research and policy advocacy. So imagine the huge opportunity to change this. Many of you may be in positions in companies and corporations to do so in the future. In fact, I believe, I truly believe that India has so much potential to raise the standard of dignified living of our people through conservation itself. To give just one example, we export about $100 million of honey every year, mostly it seems to the US. It helps the livelihoods of small farmers, beekeepers, also improves the prospects of pollination. And there are hundreds of such examples to give, including that of the millet revolution, which can save the water that our forests have to produce. There is so much green infrastructure to yet be built out in this country, and so much that can be a good investing opportunity. And so while the challenges are enormous, the opportunities are begging for attention. The union government and state governments are ready and willing for strategic partnership with, with the bazaar sector. And so it is now really up to Samaj and Bazaar to work with the Sarkar to make Indian innovation and economic growth earth-friendly and forest-friendly. It is obviously very difficult, but it is certainly not impossible. And so, as I come to a close, let me just say this. You, the students and alumni of IIFM, are incredibly important to India. This is one of the few countries in the world, if not the only one, where despite so much population pressure, we have retained so much biodiversity all around us. I always feel so proud about this and tell people wherever in the world I travel. But yet that is fast changing and you have a role to play in preventing that change. You must act as mirrors to Samaj Bazaar and Sarkar and you must be unafraid to say when we have failed. 
to celebrate when we have succeeded and to always keep up hope because the future is what we make of it, not something decided by the past. But we cannot pretend that our ancient traditions and reverence for nature will protect us even while we try to chase a Western notion of material wealth. We must therefore now be inspired also from new models of environmental stewardship that come from the West or from the East or from wherever else they emerge. And so as I close, I will turn to Rachel Carson, the author of Silent Spring, who inspired so many Western environmental movements. Towards the end of her life, which was ravaged by cancer, she was speaking to a class of young people. And to them, she said, yours is a grave and sobering responsibility, but it is also a shining opportunity. You go out into a world where mankind is challenged as it has never been challenged before to prove its maturity and its mastery, not of nature, but of itself. And therein lies our hope and our destiny. So I'll say as I close, good luck, my young friends. Namo Vrukshebhyo Hari Keshebhyo. Homage to the trees with their green tresses. Namaste and Dhanyavad. I look forward to our interaction. Thank you very much, Rohini, for that uh, really inspiring uh, presentation. Um, and, and you've uh, covered such holistic components of almost the entire value chain of conservation that us IFMites work on and various people in this uh, call have been part of. Um, I'll not stand too much between um, you and some of the questions and comments from the audience. So uh, what I'll do is I'll first request a couple of people who've typed their questions here to start. And then in the meanwhile, I request others who have questions to think and either put it in the chat or raise your hands and then I'll call on you. But Varsha, if you could begin with your question and if you could uh, turn on the camera if possible and, and address it to uh, Rohini, that'll be great. Varsha. Yes, thank you, Swapan. Thank you so much, uh, Rohini. You you ended your talk with uh, uh, you know best wishes for the youngsters. So I just wanted to add a rider there that not all of us are such young uh, people as you imagine. Uh, I'm from the batch of '94, and uh, seriously, your talk was like uh, music to the ears. A lot of the ideas and suggestions that you put forward are. Uh, uh, they resonated quite deeply with uh, with me and I'm sure with many others as well. And one of the points that you actually mentioned early in your talk uh, was about reimagining the roles of the various stakeholders. Uh, yes. So uh, you did you did talk about uh, the role of the Sarkar a little bit uh, in the course of your talk. Uh, and my question was actually related to both the Sarkar and IFM as part of uh, the Samaj. So what role do you see for the forest department going forward uh, in, in the reimagined uh, situation? And what role do you see for professionals from IFM, especially the young ones who are now uh, graduating and will be graduating in the next few years? Yeah, thank you. I tried to cover a little bit about the forest department in my talk. But, uh, you know, institutions like IIFM, in fact, should probably, uh, you know, have, uh, I'm sure you already do this, I don't know enough. But what is just like the US has a very different structure for managing its wild areas, its natural areas and its forest areas. Is there something that we need to change? in the structure of the forest department that maybe gives more freedom to innovate and um, also to have some more decentralized decision-making. Uh, I, I feel like we need to co-create some, something that is new that can respond a little more faster and flexibly to the new, new challenges that keep coming. And they are having so many, I, I've been watching, especially the politics of human animal conflict that the forest department has to deal with. So I believe we need some more dialogue as to how we can restructure these departments. That's number one. And to the IIF, to your question about the IIFM graduates, well, as I said in my talk, I think you all have an incredibly important role to play, no matter where your alumni goes, whether you go into Sarkar, the forest department, to any academic or research institutions, if you go into the corporate sector, and of course, like my uh, erstwhile colleague Biswadeep, whether you go into the social sector, because there's a place everywhere. I really think from wherever we are, we can 
every action of ours that promotes better stewardship matters and is going to matter more and more greatly. So wherever you go, if you carry that, uh, if you carry the IIFM message with you, I think uh, that's why I said your luck, the IIFM is critical for the country's future. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Avinash, are you there? Avinash, can you ask a question? Thank you, Swapan. Uh, good evening, uh, Rohini. It was wonderful to listen to you and the thoughts, you know, you presented. Uh, I come from Jharkhand, you know, and uh, uh, it is a place, as we all know, is a, has a decent forest cover and it has a decent population of uh, tribal and PBTGs. Okay. I would say that uh, I was lucky to, you know, interact in the domain of forest rights acts in the Jharkhand. I could also do some action research on lac, uh, you know, which Jharkhand yes. produces a good quantity. Yes. And, uh, you know, during my action research and meeting with the people in the rural area, as well as in the, you know, discussion in a workshop in the urban area, I realized like, you know, when you mentioned the responsibility which the younger generation has to take up, you know, to safeguard forest and to be responsible about it. I just, you know, kind of thinking aloud and kind of just uh, asking you that, uh, do you think that, you know, introducing such courses in this curriculum of school and colleges, you know, sometimes when you are studying in a school and colleges, if something is given as a course curriculum, as a part of your course, you have to read it. And once you read, there's a quite good possibility that you will get more, you know, uh, interested about that. So I just, it has come to my mind after listening to you, it's a very important point that engagement of youth with this uh, very important uh, resource. So just thought to listen from you about it. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think uh, we already have got environmental sciences as a core, uh, part of the basic curriculum in every single school, but surely there is scope to do more, especially as I told you of the one or two of the organizations that we are working with, they're taking youngsters out into the open. And that's more important than even being inside the classroom. It doesn't matter if you get to understand a spider or an ant. Once you really understand how amazing they are, whether they're insects or large mammals, I don't think you can ever go back to just uh, going back to a life without nature. So that early exposure is critical, absolutely critical, I would think. If I had not had my grandfather's farms when I was young, because in Bombay, where I grew up, there wasn't as much nature, even as there is now. But I was lucky to go to my grandfather's farm for every holiday. And that's where I learned a little bit um, uh, to, to understand what nature really is. And every, every single child has the right um, uh, to have a joyful childhood in nature and allow them to understand nature better even from an academic point of view. So I couldn't agree with you more. The more we do, the better. Let's catch them young so that they are able to grow up with the right values. Uh, next question is from a current student, Shilpa. Shilpa, you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this talk. I really enjoyed hearing you. I've had the opportunity to listen to you before, um, sometime in Bangalore. So this was after a long time, enjoyed it so much. Um, and I've often wondered about this. We're learning about sustainable development here at IFM and I believe in it, but you know, Bangalore is growing. It seems like it's already bursting at the seams, but we're only going to grow more and we're going to become a mega city this decade, uh, which means that our population is growing by many millions. Um, uh, how can Bangalore attempt sustainable development at such a rapid pace of development and influx? Yeah, again, I'm no expert. But if you look at some of the work that IIHS is trying to do in the city by creating better policy, see, the, the city is growing much faster than it can cope with. But it is stabilized. I mean, Bombay's growth rate has stabilized. Delhi's growth rate has stabilized. I mean, the NCR region is still growing. So Bangalore will go through this, is going to go through this part of growth. And at that point, you will see, I think, um, a lot of... Uh, uh, trade-offs between creating concrete flyovers and cutting down trees. But I tell you, Bangalore's 
uh, heart is still, it still thinks it wants to become a garden city again. And wherever possible, people and citizens are moving together. The lake restoration, we mustn't forget what a success it has been. 72 lakes, there are active citizens that will continue to work to restore our lakes, to protect our parks. Actually, Bangalore's parks are quite interesting and more parks are coming up. So um, I think Bangalore citizens are ecologically aware, but of course it is going, going through a big growth spurt and it takes some time to stabilize. But I think our heart is in the right place. I think Bangalore wants to go back to being a garden city. It may take a decade, but we'll get there. Thank you, ma'am. That gives me hope and also hope in our active citizenry. So thank you. Thanks, Shilpa. Actually, Rohini, I'm going to use my moderator's prerogative and ask a question. I, I was very interested and intrigued about this whole idea of, of you know, the CSOs and their capability of generating knowledge and how it's really important to include them in the overall decision making. And I think that there is a dearth of, even though there is a lot of statistics reported on conservation in India, I think we can all agree that there is a dearth of information, both in terms of what needs to be done and also in terms of why it needs to be done. You know, the risk of maladaptation, the risk of biodiversity loss. So, so my question is that in your experience, because you've supported CSOs and some of these work successfully with the government, I know ATRI worked with Vijay when they were launching the biodiversity collaborative, etc. What do you think is the 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 inter, your experiences of some success stories? And in general, what do you think is the best way to be able to include the capability of CSOs to generate efficient empirical data on a on a repetitive basis and feed that into policy and business and turn this into a cohesive model? Who should moderate that whole union? Should it be the CSO? Should it be the government? And what are your thoughts on how this can be done? So. You know, of late, as I said, there's been a bit of a breakdown of trust between the government and CSOs. And I think we all need to work to restore it because there is government can't be everywhere. Government doesn't have infinite resources. It has so many priorities, whereas CSOs offer a lot of voluntary time and expertise. To, and they are very, very passionate about environmental causes, many of them. So I think it's first of all important to restore that trust. But obviously, they play a great role in monitoring at the grassroots level. They can do long-term observation. Like in ATRI, we have monitoring stations that go back to 25 years. So that kind of data can't be produced overnight. And it's in, and of course, uh, ATRI does work closely with the government, as does NCF, as do all the others. They try to work as closely as possible. But we need many more of such NGOs who can be at a, even from hyper-local to, to national level, they should be working at all strata because not only can they be very close to the grassroots, they, they, they can volunteer much more expertise than even sometimes the government has. And I think the passion and commitment, you cannot easily reproduce elsewhere. So I think it's very critical I watched the commitment and sincerity of our some of our better NGOs, and definitely we need them because it also today's technologies, right? Information technology, sensors, uh, cameras, very high uh, drones. There's so much new tech, data analytics using AI. When we're bringing all these things together, actually the Samad sector, the these NGOs and small businesses even are willing to use technology for wildlife conservation and experiment with it. Because the government can't absorb so much risk, whereas civil society can. And I think we should allow some experimentation and innovation to come from there and then be able to take it to scale. So I believe that CSOs play a critical role in conservation and must be encouraged in the country. And much more philanthropic capital needs to go to them than is going now. A lot is going into education and health, which of course we need, yeah. but there is tremendous wealth in this country. And I keep telling the story of why some of that wealth must be diverted towards actually conserving our own future. So yeah. sometimes I write articles about how I think the elite need to get much more involved in creating public infrastructure in creating green infrastructure actually for our own survival. It's kind of a win-win if you invest in green infrastructure, you can grow the economy. Like you said, designing livelihood through conservation, I think that that can be a major win-win, absolutely. I also I love this point about the fact that CSOs can be a means for low-risk uh, experimentation with new approaches that then the government, if the government sees it like that, I think there's great yeah. potential for partnership. The ability to take risks 
See, governments yeah. have a mandate to do other things. They can't go around taking risks and experimenting. Right. But NGOs supported by philanthropy have the ability to take some risk and to they can afford to fail. Governments can't afford to do that. So that risk-taking ability of philanthropy together with CSOs is very critical for new ideas to work at scale to emerge. So that they are like experimental labs of society. And it's very important to allow them to innovate. Absolutely. Great. Uh, Nikhil, uh, can I call on you uh, for a question? Nikhil, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Yes, okay. So, uh, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, Rohini. Mm -hmm. I'm Nikhil. Uh, I work with the Azir PMG Foundation and also live in Bangalore now. I lead the water theme currently. So, I, I meet a lot of your old friends and colleagues. Five years back. So, I you know, also I must consider myself a student of institutional development. So your point on how the forest department really needs to work together with other departments, you know, there needs to be better integration. I mean, it's music to my ears, but then, you know, having spent years in, in the development space and trying to, you know, see, I mean, and, and being party to many such failed attempts, uh, really, so to speak. I mean, I am, I am, I would really want to hear more about how you think or whether this will actually happen sometime in the near future. I just thought I'd. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's always frustrating. Convergence is always very difficult in government, right? Everyone knows it's the need of the hour, but it's very hard because everyone wants to protect their own turfs. And that's kind of natural. And the forest department in that sense has a lot of power over its territories and power is rarely given away so easily. But yes, I think, at least I have met wonderful forest department officials and they can see the need to collaborate because actually the problems are going beyond their ability to solve. They literally, they're escaping, the problems are escaping outside the forest and the responsibility is staying with their department. And so unless they are, and so they have to learn very fast to, to work cross sectorally. And I was, you know, I feel bad for them because they're trying to, apart from managing the forest, I found all these departments, they're trying to create livelihoods, they're training the tribal people, they're setting up health clinics. Because responsibility So I think the need for strategic relationships and working across boundaries is being is a felt need now. So if there are people who can create sensible bridges who can help within the government, outside the government, I think this is a very good time because see the pressure on our country, as I said, ecologically and economically. If there is any time that is ripe for strategic collaboration, it is now. So we have to hope for the best and keep working for it. I say automatically nahi hone wala hai na. Lage raho manna bhai Nikhil. Sure. No, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. No, Nikhil, for one thing we know is Nikhil is persistent. So I'm sure that that's not happening. I think we have time for one last question. Arvind, I see your hand raised. Arvind. Arvind, can you unmute and ask a question? Uh, yes, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it was a great talk. Uh, it was a pleasure hearing you. Uh, my question is that uh, you talked about uh, uh, Bazaar, Sarkar and uh, uh, Samaj. Uh, so uh, my question is that uh, we, this is the age of consumerism. So uh, we see that uh, where there is less uh, uh, consumerism in, in the far flung places uh, where uh, the so-called development has not reached, uh, the f environment in forest and wildlife are in better condition, but uh, where we we have, we 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 see mega cities and uh, so much development, bridges, dams, uh, so many uh, active business activities going on, there uh, there is deterioration of uh, environment. So, what is the middle way to go with? We we need livelihoods. We uh, we want to grow. We want to develop. 
but uh, what is the middle way that uh, we can uh, protect in this age of uh, consumerism what is uh, we have seen in the ancient age that uh, we uh, we were very uh, self sat uh, satisfied we we have basic needs and environment was in very good condition but uh, now everything has changed but we cannot go back so what is the middle way to uh, go with it yeah yeah thank you i mean this is really the question right of the decade and try to address it a little bit but you know i i have faith see in india of course we're going to go through a high consumption decade or so but see today's young people are very aware that their survival itself is dependent on how we reduce fossil fuels how we clean our air how we keep our forests they they are becoming more and more aware of it and we have seen in uh, in countries in the west actually there is an emerging post consumption generation and they are quite vigorous about it and in fact they are they are proving that they can be happy in a post consumption world when i say consumption it doesn't mean you don't have anything and you're ascetic but you know what i mean they no longer want their 17th tv and their 14th car in fact they're going beyond private cars altogether when you go to copenhagen you see 3 million bicycles okay people are preferring to go on by i can see a shift especially in young people i don't know if it will happen so easily in india but actually in a decade from now as we begin to see the impacts of what we are doing i think young people will take the lead to shift their mental model and we must all help them to do so by personal example and if that's too difficult at least in whichever way they want us to help them but we have to keep the faith and the hope that when we come, when there is a crisis young people will seize an opportunity for change so that's what i truly believe and while it may take some time in india we have to go through this hum i think we can reach a point like that this is a 5000 year civilization we have been through everything we have we shall go through this we have a basic resilience and an ability to 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 adapt and um, let's hope that young people uh, will see the truth of this i mean yeah, sure. the generation has left all the problems for them so now they have to uh, figure their way out through this maze and i think they will i meet so many i meet hundreds of young people who are asking these questions and not and changing the way they live they may not be representative of the 360 million young people in the country of of, of the very young age but there are enough of them and you need only one leader to be able to inspire a million people so i have seen such leaders yes ma'am um, uh, i also uh, always uh, try to lead with my own example uh, to do simple things that that can inspire us but uh, uh, let's hope that, that everybody uh, gets uh, encouraged uh, and uh, do whatever they can do in their own capacities uh, thank you so much arvin uh, roni i'm conscious of time it's 8:30 there are a, a one or two more questions do we have the time or should we Uh, do you have a couple of minutes more? Yeah, sure. If there are a brief okay. questions, certainly. Okay, the, so, Aditya, the very last question, and Aditya, if you could keep it brief, that'll be great. Aditya. Sure, sure. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear me. Hi. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello. Thank you, ma'am, for the inspiring talk. I would just uh, expedite to my question. So, I work in the nature conservancy in the riverine restoration, and. Uh, in restoration and when we uh, restore a landscape or uh, a fraction of that landscape it generally uh, requires 3 to 5 years to restore it to a certain level and when i see the trend in the trust uh, the various trust and the various uh, csos that are there it there is a particular emphasis on uh, having a scale to have, what's the scaling strategy what's the exit strategy how can we achieve 1 million hectares of uh, restoration and how many 20 million people are being affected by it so but this is uh, it is very difficult because the process is very capital intensive and labor intensive so i would really like to know your thoughts on it that what is it about that we are so obsessed with the quantity of restoration and not just going into the actual quality of it yeah thank you no no i i really agree i i really see the feel the pain and i hear you as a donor i try to be and we try to give patient capital we try to understand the complex realities on the ground 
the CSR laws kind of hold people back and they, have, they think they have to respond to their shareholders also in a particular way and to the government in a particular way. But believe me, there is a new class of donors coming up uh, who are understanding these things that you are talking about. And certainly my job is to go and talk to as many philanthropists and wealthy people as I can, wherever I can find them, to say that we should, how can you people, and actually I'm a bit of an outlier, you who have been so successful in the corporate career because you took risks, can you please take more risks when you're working in the conservation and social sector, allow some flexibility of your funding in your funding, and then you see what happens and uh, give it some time because this is nature, it's not a factory where you can pull out results. And I think people are beginning to see that and especially the private philanthropy of the new young wealthy who have a very different attitude towards wealth than the older philanthropists. I think they are more open to this. But I'll tell you one more thing, as we point one finger, three fingers point back at us. I think the NGO sector needs to tell its stories much better and to convince donors much better with very seriously good storytelling. I think maybe we have been a little faulty in that. And I hope you can win over some people with that. There's also a comment related to that, Rani, in the chat. Somebody, Varun, has said that uh, a part of the convergence and the responsibility for convergence also lies in the civil sector because we also tend to work with partners that we are comfortable with. So our NRM NGO tends to work only with the forest department and not the other departments. So it's not only the government, it's us and our uh, uh, collaboration patterns also that need to evolve in response to yeah, what so needs I, to be done. Honestly, the environmental NGOs in this country, and I know that they have very different ideologies, okay? And some of them won't talk to each other, I know that. And, and it's for good reason, that's fine. But now they really, really, really need to come together with a common minimum program. And it has to come from them. It cannot be donor driven, it cannot be government led. It has to come from environmental NGOs. They have to come together on a common minimum platform because they need to be able to have a dialogue with government at all levels. And they need to do it together. So I really hope many of them will come together because it's really a time. It's a very critical, very, very critical time, isn't it? So I hope they can go past their differences because their goals are common. Their broader vision is common. Sometimes the pathways diverges too much. Time to converge there, like you said. Um, I cannot help but give the floor to Bishwadi because he's made a comment and this uh, conversation would not have been possible without his support. So we have to relent and then that will be the last, last, very last question and then we'll conclude. Bishwadi. So nothing like that. So I mean, she's covered a breadth of topics and she was clearly running out of breath while we were running out of time. Uh, and there's so much to discuss. So the point about strategic conversation, uh, partnerships, Rohini, I mean, uh, this is one off and we are all concerned for time. We know that you support a whole lot of work around forest based issues through your philanthropy. And the question that I put in there is that, uh, can we forge some partnerships with IFM? Uh, both would stand to benefit immensely because I know both sides, uh, in some ways. And at least uh, it will help in continuing with the conversation. It's one of conversations. It's very nice to hear, but we need different operating models. I mean, one such conversation you were having with Vineet, I think, in some other forum on payment for economic uh, ecosystem services, that one hope would lead to a different kind of operating model that the country needs so badly. So that was my request, apart from uh, just a word to say thank you on behalf of IFM. I really didn't do much. I mean, it was Swapan and his team and Sandeep and Ravi sir who are behind this initiative. But thank you again for uh, raising this. Thank you. Thank you, Vishwadi. We'll certainly be in touch. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rohini. This has been delightful and this has been very, very inspiring. Thank you very much for your time and your energy. Um, and there's a lot to carry uh, for us to carry home with, especially this idea of Sarkar, Samaj and Bazaar and how uh, IFMites actually being uniquely placed in all three for conservation have an opportunity to really foster that convergence 
which is so critical for development and sustenance of ecology of this country. And also the fact that both of those go hand in hand and that's a message we have to keep, keep, keep uh, conveying to our decision makers. So on behalf of IFM, the Alumni Association, I want to thank you very, very much. Um, and, and we'll definitely look forward to continuing this dialogue and collaborating with you in the future. Thank you so much. Um, Namaste. Um, uh, one last announcement, everybody. Our next month's call is going to be with uh, Mr. Pradeep Kishan, and it'll be on rewilding, and we'll convey the details and times. Rohini will also share it with you. If you have the time, it'll be great sure. to have you. Sure, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Namaste. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Namaste. Thank you to the director especially. Thank you. Thank you.